And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother into the temple, previously known for... Pre previously known as as Mr. Turnip in some in some cases, and the designer of Miracle, and now and now developing a, a little bit of a fan project known as Do Prism Tactics, a mix up a mix of FF Tactics and and final and um well Do Prism or as we or as we Yanks called it Threads of Fate, jury's out which is a better name. <laughs> The <laughs> one and only Caleb Clanton. How you doing today, man? Howdy, hello, Navarino. Good to see you again, man. It's been years we last spoken. It is good to be in your presence once more. Yeah, it's it's been a it's been a couple of years. In <laughs> fact, let me let me do a quick search to see. Oh, it's been about two years since I had. Oh yeah. I had you on back in April of twenty twenty. So it has been five years. It's still though, like between the, the pandemic and everything else that's happened, it's been a very busy two years. Feels like four in my head. Uh, for me, it's a, for me, it's a case of of I take I take things day to day, and I use and um, I'm reminded of an old saying about the forest not caring about the middle seasons. <laughs> well put. You know, only caring about only caring about whether or not it's winter. Well, indeed. Of course, of course. In your in your neck of the woods, I'm pretty sure the same the same thing. You could apply a similar thing, except in, except replace winter with raining. Oh yes, the rainy season. It comes and it's like a nightmare. Big black billowing clouds, the wind howling, the roof shaking. It's a uh, something special. Yeah, there was a bit of that. There was a bit of that a few months ago, and there were even some big ass hail. Oh yes, yes, that too. <laughs> I've, like I saw, I saw some people taking photos of hail the size of a baby's fist. Jeez, it's been years I've seen hail that big. Mm -hmm. Just add it to the re to the list of reasons why I believe that Mother Nature is on drugs. <laughs> Which drugs? Uh, yes. All of them at once. She's been hanging out with Hunter S. Thompson. We'll put it that way. But <laughs> so, do prism tactics. Um, was this something that you were kind of developing on the side while you were working on Miracle, or did the idea come after the fact? Do prism tactics. Yeah, it definitely has an idea. Uh appeared right around the time I finished Miracle and I was thinking about what I wanted to do next and right around the time that I did, you know, as I was ready to say, okay, I'm done I picked up Final Fantasy Tactics uh, War of the Lions, which is a port for Android, and then over the course of the next week, I shoved 200 hours in. I fell in love with it immediately and I thought it was such a great system and it's wonderful and great and that I'd like to make a game that takes its best features and amplifies them and takes its worst features and fixes them. Mm -hmm. And um, I have I have War of the Lions, but I don't have it on Android. I have it on my PSP. Um, nice. I'm not I'm not sure if the Android version fixed the slowdown problem that could happen with some of the animations. Although I'm, I'll be honest, I. <laughs> Sorry? I um I do miss the I do miss the fact that War of the Lions did not allow me to do the du duplication glitch. Ah, uh. that was a that was a infamous glitch that that people had exploited in the original um, PS One version. Really? You dig around you dig around a bit you'll fi you'll find it. I think it's got its own section on the wik on the wiki, but. Overall, war, overall, that version is I consider to be better in better in some ways than the original, even if it doesn't have the guest appearance by Cloud. But 
I'll be honest, he wasn't all that good. <laughs> yeah. I would say, like, the, I think mean, the last time I played the original PSS, uh, PSX version, I was like eight. I was a little kid at the time, and my idea of a game was not that. I, I wasn't much of a reader. I didn't understand the math. And so at the time, little old me was like, oh, this is too hard. I don't like it. And, you know, fast forward, like, 15 or so years, my brain's like, I love math. <laughs> my, my mentor was somebody who kept insisting that I get more that I that I get more advanced games. I remember he um I remember one I remember one I remember wanting to get I think it I think it was Mar I think it was um I can't I think it was like I think it was a I can't remember what Mario game it was, but it was it may have been Mario sixty four. Um and he was like, no you need something more advanced and he pl and um a few weeks late. A few weeks later, he plops me right in front of um, Civilization for the first time. <laughs> um, if I want, if I want to get specific, it was Civilization Two. And how'd it go? Are you familiar with the one? Are you familiar with the phrase "one more turn"? <laughs> okay. Oh, good. He got hooked on it immediately. Yeah. Yeah, and that, and then I just went further and further down the rabbit hole, going with, going with games on console and PC that I, that were probably that I probably shouldn't have in any situation. I was one of those people who would, who would find creative ways to get around buying an M-rated game when I was still sixteen. <laughs> I think the, I think the fact that I'm so tall helped. Ah, <laughs> uh, nice, nice. You know how you know how some places have the um eat, have the discount if you if if for a kit for kids thirteen and under. There were time there were times yeah. I had to show my I had to show my school ID because nobody believed that I would that I was just twelve. Wow, was, I've had this problem before too. Uh, the problem the problem was I was too damn tall. <laughs> And let me guess, you like hit puberty early too, and so you had like a little mustache thing going on too, right? No. No, uh, I was I was too I was taller than average when I literally when I was born. I was one I was wow. one foot eleven inches long. Nice. So <laughs> it was it wasn't just a case of really early puberty or anything like that. It was a case of I had a he I had a head start. <laughs> but it's but bringing to get bringing together thread th bringing together threads of fate and FF tactics is an interesting combination. Now, there's no shortage of Final Fantasy themed TTRPGs out there. When it comes when it comes to fan projects, I did a whole special a, a couple of years ago called FF Week called FF Week. Obvi obviously, I'm working on my own, but each of them are doing are doing something different, or they're adapting a system a system that already exists, like say FFD20, which is a Pathfinder adaptation. Though you'd be hard pressed to use um, Pathfinder classes in its rules. <laughs> uh, and of course, you have the, you have all the games that sprouted off from the original Returners project. Yeah, but. When, were you familiar with in, with any uh, with any of the fan projects or and if not what ca what was the design goal that you had for Do Prism Tactics All right so the design goal of Do Prism Tactics it, it really did start out as a, a fan project when it first started uh, cuz uh, Threads of Fate is like the first game I truly loved it turned me into a storyteller and it gave me a love of JRPGs from that time onwards. Uh, I love the style of it. I love the story. I love the the uh, oh my screen went off. There we are. I loved everything about it, and I'd go to love it, you know, for the next several years as I tried to actually beat it. Because at the time, I wasn't I was a little kid. I, I didn't. I wasn't very good at games, um, and I ended up beating it actually for the first time when I was like seventeen. So hooray! But aside from that, though, 
Duke, Duke Prism has this very special place in my heart. And for the longest time, I've wanted to make a game that kind of captured that free-spirited innocence to it. Um, that joy of, you know, the classic story of, let's go save the world and stop the bad guy and do everything else. And it just so happened that I was working on, you know, I wanted the, uh, I wanted to do a, a Final Fantasy Tactics uh, sort of game, so that followed the same general pattern of mixing and maxing jobs. And I thought, hey, you know what? I have this great system. Let's go ahead and give go ahead and give it a whirl. And so that's why I combined the two. If you look at it at the rules, you see that it has basically Final Fantasy Tactics, you know, mechanics, mm -hmm. but Duke Prism's flavor and uh, and lore, or you know, just kind of flavoring. Mm -hmm. um, like all the classes. If you look at the classes, you'll see they're all based every single one of them off of one of the enemies or monsters or heroes that you can play inside of Threads of Fate. Mm -hmm. But in terms of progression and combat, it follows roughly a similar system to uh, Final Fantasy Tactics or Final Fantasy 1. Yeah. Oh. Although, I'd, I'd have to call into question the FF1 the FF comparison because, because you're not doing that spell charges thing that I absolutely hated. I hate the Vancean model in D&D, I hated it in Suikoden, and I hate it in FF1 and 3. <laughs> You're right that it doesn't do too many of the uh, of those similar mechanics, especially for spells. For spells, I base it off of Final Fantasy Tactics to an extent. Uh, you can't. There are some spells that use a lot of mana, and there are rules for charging spells in case you don't have enough action points available. They'll just happen on the next turn uh, ahead of time. But uh, I do say I, I borrowed a little bit from Final Fantasy 1 and the early Final Fantasy games in sort of a, how the spacing and maneuvering works. Instead of a grid or a hexagon grid like you would see in Pathfinder or other games like Hicks and Draconis, this system it has a it kind of looks like fish scales or like a jigsaw. They're the, the units of movement are measured in spaces of any shape that are roughly 15 to 25 feet in length. Um, and that's so that, that makes up the jigsaw-like grid that you'll see in a lot of the maps, uh, especially in the ones that I've been using. And instead of being only one person per space, an infinite amount of people can fit into a single space. And so you get fights that kind of look like, um, you know, the original Final Fantasy battles, where you'd have one people on this side and then the R team on that side. Except it now also has that modern flair of having an entire battlefield. And so there's a definitely a twist as to what a combat can look like. Now combat is less about movement and more about uh, positioning and cooperation. And the other thing that I the other thing that I notice is that if I'm not mistaken, you're using a you're you're using an AP system when it comes to action economy, instead of having action types or or the or the or just the or just the basic and bonus stuff. Um, was this what in an early doc in an early draft of this? Where did you ever try to um? emulate the charge time mechanic that's in Tactics? I really didn't want to, and that was actually part of the reason why I did this as a uh, web document instead of just a PDF. Mm -hmm. But as it, <clears throat> as it came down to it, I realized that it would be just, for my current skill level, too difficult to synchronize the turn order with everyone else as they as the AP was constantly regenerating. And you can see sort of that the, the system is ready to do that though. Uh, given the chance, I could actually embark upon that. It's why your character's initiative scores are measured in tens and around that area instead of zero like traditionally. And so that your initiative score could easily be turned into a speed score plugged into a turn calculator that's constantly determining who goes next as you're 
AP uh, as your turn meter resets. I can, I can, and I can, I can certainly get that, especially since some. Um, there's whenever you have a limited resource in game in games, you end up having what I like to call the rainy day paradox or the ninety nine mega elixirs effect. Yeah. Uh, you know that that person who will who will hold on who will hold on to the to uh, to items until the en until the end of time. Or, or, what if I can't use one of my ninety-nine mega elixirs? What if, what if I need it for later? He, <laughs> said, he says right in the middle of the final boss of the game. Yeah, that 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 definitely does. It has proven to be an issue in games like that, especially in uh, games like the original Final Fantasy Tactics, where one wrong move can be so unforgiving. Um, and so you just kind of like learn to hoard on stuff. In this game, I'd say that healing mechanics and mechanics to make combat more forgiving are more in abundance and built in, into it, mm -hmm. so that it's easier to recover health or to, um, you know, recover from a death or even a loss or something like that, something big. So that way it's not so frustrating and a bit more forgiving than the original Final Fantasy Tactics was. In which case, you don't really have rainy day syndromes as often as you do. In fact, I recently installed crafting mechanics. So that way, you don't have to hold on to all these materials from your fights. You can just build stuff with them that are more useful and more appropriate to the situation. Mm -hmm. Now, a problem that I've had in, when, some ga when some games do, cra do crafting systems is, requi is requiring a degree of specificity when it comes to the when it comes to the recipe so you end up having cases where you where you should be able to craft something but you're missing one particular item and you don't even know where to find it <laughs> <laughs> that i definitely uh i emphasize that mm -hmm. uh especially how crafting games or survival games become so popular in the last few years and a lot of people just don't get it, and so they make really bad crafting systems. If we look over inside of the crafting material sections right now, we can actually see that a lot of the uh, things we have use a very limited amount of uh, unique ingredients, mm -hmm. such as, you know, at max, three items. But for the most part, most of the uh, things that you can craft only need one or two things. So it does make it a bit more straightforward, easier to do. And what it also means that after a fight, you do know that there's something you can do at least uh, with the stuff that you've acquired from the monsters you've slain. Uh, like, for example, if you want to make night vision juice, all you need is a single eye from one of the enemies that, uh, that the enemies drop when you defeat them. And it's really easy to do, and the craft check is really simple. Mm -hmm. Now... I would like to, I would like to talk a bit about the class, the class system that you have planned because. Oh yes. Now, you talk about you. You've talked about doing a mix and match approach with with classes, and and um, what a, one thing that I'm curious about with that is, does that mean that a would that mean that a class is more akin to a pa a package or even something like the ability lists that are that are found in game books and powered by the apocalypse rather than the usual 20 level class setup yeah i'd say it's kind of like a package from the start and uh, i would have liked it to be, be a bit more like how how it was in final fantasy tactics but based upon rules and complexity and i decided to go for a more package deal where from the very start once you get access to a class you get access to all of its abilities um, so, uh, but I would say that it does share with, uh, FFT how as you stay in the class long enough, certain, uh, vital scores start to improve over others. So if you want a character that's really strong and has a lot of health, you'll stay in that particular class for an extended period of time. But as for the abilities, yeah, you, you do get all of them from the start. The only abilities that are off limits from the beginning are the master abilities 
which you get access to one of when you reach level 20. Mm -hmm. Some abilities, though they are rare, are actually uh, empowered by how many levels you have in, a spe in that specific class. And so, at first they might be really awful, but if you just stay with that class, Last long enough to become useful. If you want, I can give you an example. Go ahead. All right. Uh, scale armor. It's a. It's part of the YLF class. Second one listed, and it is a form of defense. It activates when you're attacked, and if you just spend five points of stamina, you can go ahead and make a luck check to see if you're a hit. And from the beginning, beginning, you have to get. 20 or higher, which of course is stupidly high and not really useful. But if you keep taking levels inside of the class, for every level taken, the difficulty of the luck check decreases. And so if you stay in that class for up to maybe like 10 or 15 levels, suddenly that useless ability is indispensable. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was looking at the cl when I was looking at the classes. Um, I did. I did see that each of them has has nine abilities. Would you, beca because of the free form nature that you seem to be going for, would someone need to pick those abilities in order aside from doctrine, which I'm guessing is the base um ability? Let's see. Uh, what, what what do you mean by in order? Um, in numerical order. Uh, no, in this case, the uh, numbers are mostly arbitrary. Uh, their listing doesn't really have anything to do with their um, importance or which you should learn in which order you should learn them. And to, and um, I'm guess in that with that in mind, I'm guessing that the. Do that um the doctrine ability is the one that you're gonna get right out of the gate, and every every time you level up, you'd pick from one from one of the other nine. Yes, the doctrine ability cannot be learned normally. You can't sideboard it. Uh, there's only one condition under which you can learn doctrine ability, and you have to get a very rare item to do that. Other than that, the doctrine is attached to the class. The other nine abilities you can learn and you can sideboard to mix and match with classes later on. Okay, given that, given that, um, I suppose I should ask the obvious: what is sideboarding? Sideboarding is a term that I first learned uh, with Magic: The Gathering, where if you go to tournaments, you'll see some players who have not just one deck but multiple decks and some people have toolboxes just full of cards and the players will play together they'll go around and then at the end of the round when one has lost the players who still have two more battles with each other will go over to their sideboard which is kind of like a private library and they will modify their working deck in order to be more correctly fitted to their opponent and so just the same as you learn abilities in, or as you take levels inside of uh, Do Present Tactics, you get to choose a one of the nine non-doctrine abilities to sideboard, and that gets kind of set off to the side. Then when you take your next level, you can look into your sideboard abilities and choose one to replace one of your other uh, packaged abilities. And so with that, you can start mix and matching for real this time. And give the other th the other thing that I'm the other thing that I find a bit I find a bit curious is the um, this trinity of melee magic and skill, which I primarily see with the with the uh, we with the weapon and not weapon and armor setup. Um, are you tr are you trying to go for a s are you trying to go for a setup where? Um, Having we're having a me, having a melee magic or skill is going to determine not just your not just your ability to hit, but your ability to not get hit. Yes, uh, we do have something like that right now with the evasion score. Uh, so in combat, 
uh, your melee accuracy is at your... If you make a melee type attack, you'll take the accuracy score that belongs to it, and you will pair it against the... Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, and you will pair it against the evasion score of the enemy that you're going against. Um, so, for example... And so this means that some enemies are better at defending against certain types of attacks than others, which, of course, is tied into their own theming. Mm -hmm. uh, so take, for example, we have... Uh, let's take the Polywog as a good start. So the Polywog has an average score, uh, average evasion score of 10, and a accuracy bonus of 1. If I were to take, the, take his accuracy score, make an attack with it, a melee attack, I'd add 1 to my d20 check. And then suppose I went and targeted someone else, like the King Ant. Because I'm making a melee attack, I will target the King Ant's own melee evasion, which in this case is 11. I gotta roll, and my final score needs to meet or beat that. Mm -hmm. Now, give, given that... Given that um... Obviously, there's obviously there's only one type of each. Are you are you aiming for a a expanding weapon an expanding um, weapon list, or are you aiming for a base wet? Are you aiming for a small set of base weapons that's for that's meant to be more customizable? The latter. Uh, I'd say uh, actually in this game weapons aren't that important. Uh, your class will be doing the bulk of the work. However, uh, a lot of the classes do actually ask you to work with a weapon of some kind, primary or secondary. And for the most part, the weapon itself is less upon, is more defined by its attributes, um, the, the special bonuses that it gets. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, the only differentiating factor between weapons is going to be its weight class. And when it comes to weight class, what is what is that, and how is how is that going to work? A weight class is the general measure of how powerful a weapon is. There are five ranks: uh, very light, light, medium, heavy, and very heavy. And these weapons kind of follow in a more of a standard, uh, closer to D and D in this case, where the lighter a weapon is. Um, the easier it is to use, or the more accurate it is, or the more attacks you can make with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, we have uh, the five the five ranks. With very light weapons, you can actually use uh, a very light weapon. You can, or sorry, a very light weapon can be used twice a turn for free. It doesn't cost any action points, but it only does very little damage. Likewise, uh, very light. You can use it two turns, but only but it, each attack costs uh, five action points, mm -hmm. so it's a bit costier. And then medium costs ten action points per use. Heavy costs ten action points plus three stamina, and the very heavy costs even more stamina. Now the power in this case is determined by its rank, and the rank is actually a term you're going to see a lot, especially in relation to abilities. Uh, we have five ranks, one, two, three, four, five, and they are used in multiplication in a fashion that is, this time, directly inspired by Final Fantasy Tactics, mm -hmm. where you have your base power scores, and then it's multiplied by the uh, score of your weapon. Abilities will use ranks by, their self, by themselves, uh, and, uh, yeah, abilities will use ranks by themselves in conjunction with your own uh, power scores. So it's always, in every case, rank times power is determines the actual damage done. Mm -hmm. So in this case, this game is a bit heavier on math in comparison to uh, other tabletop role-playing games you might come across. I'd... I'm probably the I'm probably the worst person to make to make that comparison given some given some of the stuff that I've that I've covered and some of the rabbit holes I've gone into. <laughs> oh, especially especially since Phoenix Command is somewhere is somewhere on my shelf in the back, and 
I'm not running Phoenix Command again unless I'm paid. <laughs> and, I can understand that. And of course, of course, I still, I still have an old copy of Rifts, and I, if I'm, if I'm running Rifts, and it isn't the Savage Worlds version, I expect to be paid for hazard pay. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Oh. Hazard pay, hazard pay, and and, and um. Emotional distress, <laughs> because trying to because trying to navigate through some of those riffs books or just any Palladium book can be a royal pain, and of course, of course, I still have, I still have, um, Rollmaster inspired stuff, which is charts for days. So, um, oh yeah, I guess you you point it from a perspective like that. It's do prism tactics isn't that bad. I from everything that I've seen of it, I consider it crunch medium, about the same level really? of crunch as as some as something like as something like Savage Worlds. Um, it isn't trying to be as as full crunch as say, um, pa a experienced Pathfinder game can get. <laughs> it isn't trying to be a, it isn't trying to be as light as. Um, fate or powered by the apocalypse. Thank goodness. Okay. Th so yeah, that, I see that. So it's in that it's in that Goldilocks position. Um, thirteenth thirteenth age and unchained, and to a lesser extent, unchained heroes are in that same category. Mm -hmm. um, as well as some as well as some of the. Some of the games that use that use Chaosium's basic role playing system, mm -hmm. and it's the it's the um, crunch medium is what is where my preferences lie because I find that I find that a lot of rules light -like games don't don't allow me to personalize all that much and depend and double down way too much on the role playing part and forget that this is still a game. <laughs> yeah. I see your point too, and that's also one of the problems I have with the super right, uh, super light rules, rules like games. Well, I'll use Fate as an example. The big reason that I keep picking on Fate is that it doesn't, it doesn't do a good job defining what is a good or bad aspect, and and that's and the aspect thing is crucial to its system. <laughs> also. And while this isn't as much of an issue after character creation, I don't like having um, having the re having refresh, which is used for fate points, get drained as you if you take if you take more than the standard amount of stunts, which is one of the stunts are one of the key ways to customize your character mm -hmm. in terms of giving him some some sort of ability or the like. I see. It's I, I've I've noticed this at least as far as the rules like games go, that they go well just as long as you are playing with a table full of people who are all on the same page and on each other's sides. Do you want me, do you want, do you know anything by that? Yeah, um, and if I'm being honest, I'm not sure I'm not sure that's the best approach because. You're relying on certain. You're relying on assumptions, and maybe maybe I'm bi maybe I'm biased because I read I read way too many, um, way too way too much stuff regard regarding science. But if you have to rely on if you have to rely on assumptions when it comes to a hypothesis, your hypothesis is weak. No, I'll give you that. And besides, you are a game reviewer. Your your goal is to have an eye for these things and to have a taste for them mm -hmm. and taste is real and that's the re that's actually the reason why I don't whenever I've done reviews I don't really do a scoring metric because I find I find that doing doing out of tens or out of fives or what or what have you creates more problems that's also true and instead I go for a instead I go f I tr I go for a tier system that's built around how easily I would recommend something. Sometimes a game is easy to recommend, sometimes there's a few asterisks. That's right, and that's very true as well. 
because you know as you've seen and as you try to explain this is very a very subjective realm and as far as tabletop role playing games well a lot of them are quite objectively good but not all of them are for everyone because we have roles like games we have certain themes of games uh everyone has a flavor for the most part there's there's a there's a line that I've seen some people insi insist a bit too a bit too forcefully that I that that I think I think they need a bit of an uncomfortable truth about and that is that tabletop is for everyone which I think I think that's a bit misleading anybody can yeah. get into tabletop but not everybody ta not every tabletop game is going to be good for everybody Oh yeah, that that's easy to. I can easily agree with that. I would not plop do prism tactics in front in front of a war gamer. <laughs> <laughs> just to use just to use one example, I've that if and if some if somebody is is say is say a fan of um, fantasy anime or even isekai anime. Might not be the best idea to have them play a Lord of the Rings RPG. Yeah, that's that's kind of that's why who I'd recommend it to is is crucial in that in that kind of thing. Um. Now, one thing that I, one thing that I was a bit a bit a bit um curious about is when it comes. When it comes to when it comes to the way you have um the way you have monsters set up, I I did I find it a bit I find it a bit amusing that it appears you appears you have kind of your own version of the monster role thing that was in D and D fourth edition, i.e. the edition everybody tells me I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because the check didn't clear. Ah, I'm not familiar with that. How does that work? They in in fourth edition they introduced this concept of of monster roles, not classes per se, but a descriptor to give a general idea on it on its behavioral patterns. Um, the biggest one, of course, is solo, which are big monsters that are meant to take on a whole party by themselves. But then you have you have sappers you. Which are all which are the stealthy boys. You have controllers, which are your AOE boys. You have um, minions, which are meant which are meant to have one eight are meant to have one HP and de and deployed on mass. And you and you have you have a you have um, skirmishers, which were basically attackers. I I likened I liken it to the pos to the positions in a sports team. Ah, I see now. It's it's less, uh, it's less. It was more about you about using these various roles to create to create a kind of monster a kind of a monster synergy for the GM instead of a one size fits all mon um, monster sheet. And I kind of see that with with this where you where you have several entries that have have variants based on the t based on the role like with um. I'll use the stinger that I see in the monster list as an example. You've got three versions of it: one for, one that's the mob, one that's the grunt, and one that's the heavy. Oh yes, that's right. Monster types. Um, so yeah, we have grunts, mobs, and heavies, and that was very much to deliver on my part. In the original uh, game, we didn't have. I we actually had like a ton of different bosses, but. As for monsters, they were just kind of came at you in waves, and I thought it would be easier for for DMs in this game to set up encounters if they had more ability to control the numbers and the difficulty of the opponents by uh, weakening them uh, artificially by changing their type from grunt, mob, heavy, or even a mini boss. Uh, but that's like later on. Um, but those are three main grunts or three main types. And as you weaken or improve them, wherever you choose, you're supposed to either add more or fewer. And it's actually kind of based into the meta itself 
that when the testing for this game was initially done, before even any testing with any other players was done, it was just me and a calculator, I didn't realize it at the time, but I had been grading the monsters for one-on-one -on -one fights. And so the way in order to better control this and to make it more fair uh, was using the FAR system, uh, reducing power scores and modifying the earth stats in a kind of sweeping, easy way. And then, of course, you also have quirks that well that help to also differentiate monsters from each other and make them more unique and make some monsters more dangerous or more prioritized over mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. And the, with that in mind, there's one other there's there's one mechan there's one mechanic that is very video game very key to vid to video games, but it's one that some people either frown on utilizing or or just haven't utilized it properly, and that is the introduction of aggro. Yes. That, it took me two weeks to get that working. <laughs> the first week when I introduced, because the players, my players actually said they wanted aggro. They wanted, um, they thought it'd be more fair and that make it my combat more strategy, you know, strategy inducing. And so I tried to implement it, and I did it really straightforward at first. So uh, one week I said, "All right, here are the rules for aggro. Uh, as you, every amount of damage you do is recorded, and the monsters will always attack the opponent who has done the most amount of damage." And when that first happened, it went horribly because we had our glass cannons getting smashed to pieces early on in the fight, and our tanks were not able to tank. And our, our players said, "Okay, you know what? I have fun, but I really hate that system. Fix it." And I went, "Okay." So I went in ahead and I just stripped down everything and made it as simple as possible. So now we have a really simpler, a much simpler aggro system that uh, works off of three rules. And the aggro system is now, instead of being so abstract, it's now just treated as a status effect. <coughs> one person on, or one player on each team gets the aggro effect first depending on their initiative. Whoever goes first gets aggro. Then, if you ever defeat an enemy, like like neutralize them, you now gain aggro. And if you were to attack a uh, an enemy or a, a leader enemy, that would get you aggro as well. And to help complement that, tankier classes such as um, Gorotan and uh, Cloud Whale, they have aggro drawing abilities as well that make them keep aggro for a certain amount of time so that way they can tank and draw attention and to help control the crowd better. We tried that out last week and it worked out wonderfully. The, the players, our playtesters, all four of them were very pleased. Mm -hmm. And one, th one thing that I had also seen that I find interesting is the use of is the use of a talent system basically as your XP for skills but but not at but not in the traditional skill list um, approach cuz if I'm to be quite honest and this is this has gotten some people annoyed yeah D&D &D it... is not was never designed with skills in mind some people say, "What about the skill list that th that thieves had in in AD and D? That was their feature." When you look at other games that ha that have an attribute and skill system right out of the gate, those are built with it in mind. Which is why the skill, which is why skill use in D in D and D, in my opinion, has always been so awkward. It was never built for it. I see what you're saying as well, and and we shall say that's. Probably true, like really, really true. Uh, I remember playing, you know, D and D and eventually Pathfinder, and you know, they both use skill systems of one kind or another. And it always felt like skills were always a sort of an afterthought. They never really fit into the meat of the game. They were always used um, outside of combat. But even then, using skills was always a little bit clunky, just because they could make it difficult to get into the action. Like, you know, if you want to lockpick a door, well, first you have to pick the lock. And what happens if you fail? 
uh, I don't know, just do it again. And it makes a lot of noise, a lot of extra work that just doesn't really contribute to the game. Dude Prism Tactics did not initially have skills built into it. It was la- b- b- inserted later on before pre-testing began. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the skills, I wanted the skill list to be simple as as possible. I didn't want a huge list that would just create a lot of static for the players. So that's why I kept it down to like the, the six or seven that we have featured there. Uh, let me see if I can read up real quickly. Uh, character sheet. Yeah, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six different talents. Excuse me. We have craft, harvest, scholar, navigate, acrobatic, and arts. And those weren't chosen randomly. They were actually taken from Threads of Fate uh, based on the adventures that you go across. Those are the things you see most happen. And Dupe Prism Tactics was kind of made to run the original uh, Threads of Fate game, and so I thought these would be most fitting. And for the most part, they have worked pretty well. Uh, granted, they aren't used that often, because right now we're doing mostly work on on combat. But when we have used them, they have been useful, and I feel that I've implemented them in a correct way. Like, even as far as crafting goes, uh, filling a check isn't the end of the world, and it's not going to humiliate you. It's just going to create a minor inconvenience that you will have to think through on your own as the player. Mm-hmm. And with now with that in mind, what would you say have been some of the biggest learning experiences since you've been do, since you've been doing active testing? All right, so biggest learning experiences. Well, this game is. It's I would I think I'm cheating when I say this, but I have learned a lot about web design from this. This experience was made for the intention of uh, making an easy accessible. Uh, web uh, core rulebook document, and so in order to get that done, I've had to learn a lot as far as web, web development goes. Now, more directly to game development, I say this has taught me a lot about balancing uh, and the value of pre-play and the importance of having a group of testers who are on your side. And I'll get to that in just a second, but I'll talk about the uh, value of balance first, because doing the math. Each level, or each, there's about 46 unique classes in this game, and every class has 10 unique abilities, which means that ultimately there's going to be about 460 unique abilities in this game, and all of them have to be balanced and checked against the other abilities to make sure that you don't create an infinite health loop or something ridiculous like that. And my players have been uh, honest about it. They've said, hey, this could be easy exploited. There's a rules lawyer out there who's going to use this, and they're going to use it through in the game. And so you've had to be very careful about that. Also, around this, be, pay very careful attention to your wording, because especially in crunchier games like this, medium crunch games, where there's a lot of numbers and a lot of explicit rules, you got to be very careful, or the players will easily come up with something that could break the game. And I say break the game in this case, where they have somehow defeated the puzzle by just smashing it to pieces, instead of actually playing it, the way it was intended. Um, now, of course, some players have come up with some really interesting combos, and they've worked out really well, and I congratulate them on that. But it's, you know, there's breaking the game, and then there's just kind of like figuring out a quick loophole. Then we're going to talk about the value of having good play testers. And I'll say that I was actually really lucky with this group. The first player I actually had play testing which is a friend of mine from childhood, and then he recommended me some of his friends who he's known for a while, and he thought they would like the game. And luckily, none of them were malicious or fiendish in their, their playing. Yeah, sometimes they come across a interesting loop, but instead of hiding it, they point it out to me. And if maybe I did something wrong in the middle of combat, or something was made apparent that he'd be fixed quickly, they were patient with me, and they allowed me to slightly tweak the uh, the rule or the ability mid-game so that way Val could move on more th- slowly. And so yeah, it's good to have players who are on your side. They want your game to be the best it can be while also wanting uh, you know, to be a part of the process in a constructive way. 
Mm-hmm. And what now? I I know it's I know it's a I know it's a active development thing, but what do you think you're going to be focusing on next when it comes to when it comes to refining and expanding um, do prism tactics? Well, next on my to do list, or like the the most pressing thing, is to complete all of the classes. Because um, if you look at the class page, you'll see that the final few classes are are blacked out. They don't have anything attached to them. We have classes like Fire Blob, Wabbit, uh, Trap Master, Atenacious, those, those classes, they haven't done any work for them yet. Once they're all done, I'm going to say that I've done the bulk of the work for this game, and next I want to work on making this no longer do Prism Tactics. Um, I do want to, want to eventually sell this game. However, everything here is copyrighted. All the class, all the names, all the even the title itself, do prism. That's copyrighted. I can't take that. So the next big step for this game is going to be to give it its own identity. I'm going to rename the classes. I'm going to tweak them to make them more generalized. I'm going to put more effort into world, uh, you know, the lore of the world and into adventuring to the, give it a more its own, you know, its own identity. And so that way, at the end, it will be safe to sell on the market somehow. Mm-hmm. And I I will certainly look forward to the, to that day which I do I do feel will come with time and well you know you know me you know how patient I am. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the insanity that that happens around here. Oh yes, it was quite a hike getting here. I feel that this has paid off immensely. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As mm-hmm. I often say Thank around you. here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!